Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. I always just call it the panda, but the, tech, the technical name, especially like if you're Googling it or something, is going to be giant panda. You don't want it to. What can they teach us? You know, I think pandas are such a great story for them to teach the younger generation because I think the younger generation. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Angie, this is your husband's favorite, favorite, favorite animal by far. Uh, maybe. <laughs> That's what my friend Jesse said. It's, it's one of his favorite animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of his favorite animals to talk, to tell stories yes. about. Because he got to work with them <laughs> and he loves their cuteness. Uh, they're just really expensive to take care of. Yes. Uh, John is going to be stepping in today to, to give some panda stories later on. So definitely stay tuned for that. And I'm excited. But shout out to Jesse Golden down there in, in, in warming up, I guess, New Zealand. He, he told me when I was down there about how much John just loved to talk about pandas. And so I knew we had to put this on. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I even a few years ago got him to dress up as a panda for Halloween. Yes, and yes. Because we we traded. We were both black and white creatures, and I was a black and white creature that is my favorite. Oh, let I me guess. Those. Let me guess. Let me guess. Uh, poodle? Not a poodle. Not a poodle. A, an Aussie Shepherd? <laughs> Yeah, close, no, close. yeah. Let me see. It's got hooves, and it neighs, mm. kind of, and bays, and its lives. stripes are like a fingerprint. Yeah, lives in Africa. The zebra, maybe. Yeah. Yes. So I was a zebra, the animal that I love the most, and John was a panda, the animal that he thinks is very expensive to take care of. <laughs> Can we please house- post that? Can we please when post that? Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to check with the old. I'll have to check with the old man. Um, but oh, we'll put it on Facebook if he'll let us. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so I got it. it's pretty. He, I will tell you, he is the cutest panda ever, and uh, he did get a lot of compliments on it. And most people didn't understand his. So his students understood the joke. Um, yes, but yes, and it's not that he's not a panda fan. He just is a panda. He has a, he has a special a, place in his heart. Yeah, they have a special place in his heart. And so, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a real practical guy. So, um, okay. And, he, he, and they, they, they always, when, because we're talking about pandas today, they are iconic. They are classic. Oh, they yeah. Are they're a huge. Symbol. So they are the shining star wherever you are, uh, whether they're in the wild or yeah. under human care or at a zoo. And so th- I think that was his biggest, uh, one of his biggest things about them is that he thinks all animals should be stars, not just yeah. the panda. Yeah, but I, I love the panda. I, I was going to say, I think most of our audience would argue like, no, the panda wins hands down. They're the cutest. Yes. They're the roly-poly, tumbling, just goofballs, just amazing beautiful creatures so and yep. he doesn't yep. he doesn't deny that that's for sure he just yes. he thinks he he believes that all animals are created equal <laughs> <laughs> it's they are amazing and we have a great interview this week right yes yes i'm very very excited i got to sit down with a um a very close friend of mine who actually many many moons ago i won't i won't give away our ages but many moons ago uh <laughs> he helped hire me uh mm-hmm. so it was uh kind of fun to sit back down and and have a cup of coffee and discuss pandas because he gets to take care of them every day so he had a lot of inside scoop so please check out that interview that'll be posting in a couple days you will be very pleasantly surprised. A lot of fun panda stories, a lot of a lot of insider information about behind the scenes of what it's like to be around pandas each and every day. Yeah, no, they're oh, they're I remember seeing them for the first time at San Diego Zoo. Like it was the biggest deal way back when when they got them and I just was like, "Oh, everybody wants to see the pandas." Atlanta Zoo, where Zoo Atlanta, where you and John met, right? I remember. No, we actually we didn't meet in Zoo Atlanta. We passed like ships in the night. Um oh, okay. I was there about a summer before he was there, I, was, I just did an internship, so I was in and out. And okay. uh, so, no, but yes, the pandas were there, and it was it was it was pretty cool to see them yeah. and be be uh, around them and look just watching their behavior. And they are the shining stars, so they're 
uh, everybody loves to see them and be around them and they have really good energy. And then John, the next year, a year or so later, uh, got to work with them in Atlanta. So, okay. 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 Well, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll get all the story there. Just for us, again, this is, uh, we're entering our second year. So the second episode of, of year two. So again, if you can't, please share anybody you know that loves pandas or bears or any of that, please share this episode again. Or zebras. Or zebras. Yes. Anything black and white. If, and then if you haven't rate and review, you know, on iTunes or any other platforms, it just helps us out. It's a way to give back to Angie and I, and we love reading your comments. We'll give it you gives a us shout motivation. Out. Yeah, we give shout outs and we just appreciate it. So, so getting to the panda as you know, I, my big question I have, why does this animal capture the hearts of so many people around the world? I mean, just why? Like it does. Oh, because it's just so, I mean, it's such a cliche to say it's cute, but it's, it's markings or it's cartoonish, right? With its yeah. markings almost. Um, and it's just really pleasant on the eye. And I think their behavior mimics kind of their markings as, uh, as far as they amble along and, and they sit up kind of on the back of their haunches to eat their, and, they're, and they, and their bears that eat plants. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> they have a carnivore yeah. stomach, but they're basically an herbivore. So Mm -hmm. they're just, their biology is super fascinating. And from a reproductive biological standpoint, we'll get there towards the end of the podcast, but they're very, very unique too with their reproduction, which is why they're hard to breed in captivity um, or even out in the wild. So, Mm -hmm. uh, there's, and of course, in their native homeland of Southwestern China, they're a symbol on they, you know, people, people love them and the country is very proud of them and has been working hard, uh, in recent years to help protect them and preserve the remaining of their habitat. So, which is now really only limited to the provinces of Sichuan, Gansu and Sanchai. No, Sanchai. Oh, you're doing better than me. <laughs> no, I'm doing horrible. Sichuan, I understand. That's great. Yeah. Gansu and Shanghai. I'm going to go with there Shanghai. You go. Okay. That sounds Kai. good. I think that's Kai. Yeah. In the central part of the country, uh, the range covers about three, uh, 30,000 square kilometers, uh, but only about six of that, uh, or only about 6,000 square kilometers are panda habitat. No, I, it's, the thing is like, you know, because you know, we're jumping ahead to range real quick, it's only 1% of their historic range. Like, so I wrote, you know, I wanted to, to highlight, yeah, that, they're a great conservation success story, but they are nowhere near out of the woods. Like they oh, no. still are facing and we'll get towards the end of the end when we get to, to really in depth in the conservation, they have a lot of pressures. They're facing a lot of pressure from many different directions, even though China is heavily invested in preserving these animals. Like it's a big deal there. Right. Well, when we get nutrition, we'll talk a lot about the main source of food they eat, which is the bamboo and the bamboo takes a long time to grow. And mm-hmm. It's under, and they eat a lot of bamboo because, well, they are a carnivore. They have a carnivore digestive system, but they're eating grass. So, <laughs> or not eating grass, but eating plant material. So they need to eat a lot of it. And basically, uh, anybody who looks around, whatever home country you're from, we, you, it's being built up, right? Our populations mm-hmm, mm-hmm. are growing and growing and growing and people need more places to live. We need uh, more schools, more hospitals, more stores, and that takes land. And so the same thing, of course, is happening in Southwestern China in panda habitat. And right. the government's working very hard to preserve that. But as Chris mentioned, there's a lot of pressure. There is, there is. And, you know, a couple other things. So the giant panda... Panda bear or simply panda. I think we're just going to refer to it as panda. Yes. Yeah. I always just call it the panda, but the tech, the technical name, especially like if you're Googling it or something is going to be giant panda. So you mm-hmm. don't want to confuse it with, uh, the red panda, which is a lot smaller. We need to cover them. They're very cute. Oh, John they're also very, yeah. Those they're guys. adorable. They're adorable. <laughs> yeah. Xander's got to meet red pandas before. So, uh, but, uh, but the red panda is actually not in the bear family, whereas the, so Giant is it? Panda. That's that's my question. Like, you know, ah. and, and is it a bear? And, and we'll get there. But, you know, is it really a bear? You you think of grizzly bears or black bears or, you know, mm-hmm. the sun bear. 
mm-hmm. is this a bear? You know, I uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you, yes, it is a bear because it, it looks like a bear. <laughs> I have a picture. It's like it's got the claws, it's got the body, it looks like a bear. It's got the teeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you know, again, if you don't know what a panda is, stay tuned. Don't hang up. <laughs> yeah, but like so iconic, the 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 iconic Oreo coat, black ears, black around the eyes, black nose and lips, black on its legs that rise up over the shoulder. Then mostly white everywhere else. Black legs. All the legs are black. They grow to to be almost six feet, two meters, up to three hundred thirty pounds or one hundred sixty kilograms. And they're just so they're, they're not, gorgeous. They're not a massive bear. They're not like no. a polar bear. Oh God, no. Or yeah. a brown bear. Yeah, there's. Right. I think that might be some of it too. Is they're smaller in stature a little bit, so they may be and and just those black ears and that face. I mean, it's how and their their ears are perfectly round, almost like Mickey Mouse ears. Mm-hmm. 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 In, in my and opinion. They- yeah, and they were, you know, just just to make a note too, World Wildlife Fund. That's their logo since 1961. So it's been their logo for 50 years, 50 plus right. years. You know, mm-hmm. so it's it's been an iconic animal for conservation. Thank for you, quite World a while. Wildlife Fund. One day you will yes. return my calls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> it's like we love you. We love what you do. Oh, oh, I want to work for you. I know. But... We just post our podcast every day on your website and me and yeah. Angie will just do this because then we would make enough money to do this full time. I know. I've been doing a lot of shopping uh, at, their, oh, yeah. at their site. It's because they're a great holiday gift, oh, right? Yeah. Who, needs another, yes. who needs another coffee mug or, or another, mm. you know, whatever? I mean, why not? Right. If you are, or if you are going to give a coffee mug, why not donate to World Wildlife Fund and get a panda on the coffee mug, or have your money go to, uh, I guess, uh, an Snow Leopard Trust. Snow Leopard Trust fund. is a good yeah, one. There's yeah, there's tons of there's tons of animal conservation um, sites out there. Of course, we highlight them each each and every week. Uh, but World Wildlife Fund is kind of a catch all because they there's so many species that they protect. Right. So if you yeah. if you wanted a if you wanted a T-shirt with a, oh geez, what did we elephant? Do last week? Well, I'll, I would, you can get an elephant. T-shirt what did we anywhere. do last week? No, what, no, what is I, our no, favorite? No, seriously, what is what is? Uh, we started off year two with your favorite genus. Oh, you know, I Come don't on. know if they have a smally wild ass. I there don't know go. if they would have it, but I do know that they have a narwhal. They have narwhal yeah. things. Yeah. So they have a lot of obscure. Shirts and tote bags. And Angie, really cool. Angie, Angie, we haven't released Narwhal yet. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess well, I could edit that out, but uh, there you go, folks. Okay. Oh, uh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, that's it's coming. It's coming. So, you know, more to why care. I, you know, for me, obviously, the, the face of conservation for World Wildlife Fund, for other organizations in China and Asia, I think it's critical. Because we do see a lot of, you know, trafficking of animal parts there in Asia. So what, you know, I think pandas are such a great story for them to teach the younger generation. Because I think the younger generation are the ones that are going to change the world. You know, we always say that every generation. Oh, I can't wait. The younger generation needs to clean up our mess, you know, after World War II. And then, you know, ever since then. But I honestly believe that. I honestly believe that the younger generation, um, they're energized, they're green. We develop these healthy habits habits for the they environment. Have technology, yes. understanding of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so and they're getting political. So I you know, I think the pandas are a great story to push, just like the California condor, all the things we Przewalski horse, black bald fair, all the ones with bald eagle. Yeah. So I think that's what's phenomenal about them. Now, to get to the question, are they a bear? Now, we covered this back in episode nine, polar bear. So we'll, we'll go through it really quick. The bear family is Ursidae. So you have the polar bear, the brown bear, the black bear, the sun bear, the sloth bear. So those are all in Asia, North America, and Europe. Then you have the spectacle bear, which is South America. I they're love pretty those cute. guys. Yes. Yeah, they're they, pretty cute. Uh, yeah, I had friends that worked with them, and I would get to go behind the scenes, and they're they're very charming. So we'll have to cover those. And then you have the giant panda bear, <laughs> which is way out there on their own. It's got its own little branch. The, 
It does. It does. Now, again, with the evolution, bears are a relatively young family. So we, you know, we talked about some of these other species that have been around for, for millions and millions of years. Bears only emerged about 20, 25 million years ago. You know, mm -hmm. Eurasia, North America is kind of where they, they were, they came out of. And the earliest ancestor was about the size of a raccoon. It would look like a, a bear dog type animal. It was called cephalogale. And that is where bears emerged. Now, pandas branched out relatively early from that tree. So they came out about 22 to 25 million years ago. They, when these, these emerged, they kind of immediately went their own way, their own direction. Then the other bears about 10, 15 million years ago went and formed the polar bear and brown bear and all that stuff. Now, Again, it's interesting because especially with these large, not just as large carnivores, but these are herbivores, these large mammals, a lot's not known about pandas. Oh, sure. I mean, it. I mean, even the debate with scientists has only recently been concluded. They would, of course, with all the modern day technology of DNA testing, they finally do believe that it is actually a member of the bear family. But it was thought for a while that it might be part of the raccoon family, interestingly right. enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it just, it's amazing because, you know, where they evolved and, and I know China, like scientific, China science, I mean, they're, they're really pushing ahead hard. So some of these questions should get answered in the next 20 to, to 40 years. But, you know, just more arch, not archaeologists, paleontologists and people that study this stuff. Now, what we do know about pandas is, is there is some evidence that they evolved in Europe and migrated to Asia, which is really crazy because they have found a similar species in Spain and Hungary. So that's kind of far apart. You know, you have East oh, yeah. Europe and then Spain all the way in Western Europe, but they had very similar teeth and their teeth consumed plants, right? So, you know, they shear rather than chewing, like chewing meat and stuff like us, they, they sh use their teeth to shear and then their molars, they have really big molars in the back to do that. And then they think pandas evolved in China around two and a half, you know, two to two and a half million years ago. And it was just the diet of bamboo. Oh yeah. During the Pleistocene. Right. Age. Right. Now, that? Yeah. Yeah. Pleistine? I think so. Yeah. I'll give you a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to tell me? You're the only one to tell me I'm wrong or, yes. or John. Sometimes he'll yell through the wall. That's not how you say that. <laughs> That's great. In a very loving way. In a very Yes, I'm way. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, I just, again, real quick, want to bring this up. Climate change, you know, the, the reason they believe the pandas went extinct in Europe is, again, climate was changing. And back then... 20 or well, no, you know, 11 million years ago, 5 million years ago is when this really change happened. 5 million years ago, the earth cooled a little bit because it used to be much warmer and it was more subtropical, more of these lush plants as that receded. So did the pandas, whatever bear this was 5 million years ago, ability to forage and eat. So I only bring this up because again, I, I don't know why it's a debate. Climate change is happening. Yes. The earth does go through cycles of warming and cooling. So it is normal for climate to change over time, but just not as rapidly as it happening it is happening right now. It's the climate is changing so rapidly right now. The earth is warming so rapidly right now that animals don't have the time to adapt. So normally these changes take place over thousands and thousands of years. This is happening within a hundred. And so animals are, are suffering. You know, species are suffering. Plants yeah, are I mean, suffering. Since, since Industrial Revolution, the degree yeah. of warming has been Insane. far surpassed anything else that we've been able to record going back, I think. Like hundreds of thousands of years. And the ice core samples, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ice core samples that they're getting from uh, the Arctic. Or Antarctic, sorry. Uh, the Arctic melts uh, every summer. Now, pandas... We jump to how long they live. They they live about 25 years in the wild. That's pretty good for a bear, right? And then under human care, yes. about 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so not uh, Yep, about 30. Um, I think there's been up to 34. And lifespan in the wild is not – it's it, 
They're still getting data on it. Right. I mean, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of it depends on the different pressures and things like that. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still learning a lot about them. Now, interesting. I read this as far as physiology. So they're, they have, their teeth are different from other bears. They have these really flat mm-hmm. molars in the back. It's almost like, you know, a, an ungulate. To yeah, their chew. skull yeah. is really fascinating. I don't know if, uh, if we could put a picture up in the show notes, but it mm-hmm. doesn't, it does, the yeah, like the front part strikes me as carnivore, um, but then the back doesn't, the, the, the back side of the molar. So it is, it is, it's very, very unique and interesting for a bear or a carnivore type animal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they have this thumb-like appendage. <laughs> so it's like they have this extension of the wrist bone. That helps them handle bamboo, right? So yeah, yeah. The front paws of the giant panda are different from other bears. Not surprising, knowing that they have their own little branch on the evolutionary tree. But it's due to a special bone that's found in their wrists. It, it's it's like their sixth toe, but it's kind of basically acts, if you will, like an opposable thumb. And they do. They use it uh, to grasp uh, bamboo, probably the same way that a human will use their thumbs. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's it's just for a bear to have so that. They're, that. They're very. It's very pleasing and zen, relaxing for me to watch the meat. I've been in prepping for this uh, in this podcast. I think I spent more time on panda cams than I did actually in the <laughs> researching. <I'm, laughs> researching. My mother taught me never to tell a lie. So I yeah, the research is a uh, a little bit light for me on this podcast just because I was just watching them. They're amazing creatures. They are, they're beautiful. fun to watch. I can just, they're, it's like me for horses. I can just sit there and watch them eat their bamboo all day long, holding on with their opposable like thumb and just really enjoy it. So we will, uh, there's a, there's several different panda cams for anybody who's interested. Obviously, if you're driving in the car, don't pull one up no. now. Because, <laughs> Please uh, don't. <laughs> it would not be good. It'd cause an accident because they're so darn cute. But, and we'll talk about it more uh, in the podcast later in the podcast as I focus on conservation organizations, but I spent a lot of time on the Smithsonian National Zoo's Panda Cam. San Diego also has one, and there's a couple in China. There's one out of Gangda Panda Panda Center in China, and then there's another lovely one called ipanda.com, which is a live live panda cam that is usually pretty busy. So, and of course, like tons of tons of videos on on youtube as well from probably people either visiting uh nature preserves mm-hmm. or um or uh, zoological institutions so just a lot of their behavior is documented and it's a lot of fun so if you haven't already you'll have to check out some of those sites and chris will make sure that all the notes are on our handy dandy web page yes he will <laughs> She's so good like that. Angie won't. <laughs> Angie yeah. doesn't do that stuff. If I even let you get to the website, it would like crash it. So it, it took me months, is. and I still wrestle with it. It's we're physiologists, uh, not computer yeah. programmers. Are, I'm sure. Are, I'm sure a few of our audience members, some of our faithful followers, uh, appreciate all yeah. your hard work and yeah. energy. I know I do. Yeah. I look at it. I'm like, wow, that's really pretty. Good it job, is pretty. It, uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, did you hire somebody to do that? Or did you do that all by yourself? And <laughs> I the need answer to. is he did it all by himself, folks. He, he he's uh, a researcher. He he, yeah. he for for about a month straight he stopped learning about animals and science and started learning about computer design. And podcasting, yeah. And like how to make podcasting, this work. Yeah. Website design. <laughs> audio yeah, editing. Stuff. It's, it's mm, a little learning. Yeah. I like now I like audio from uh, back yeah. in the day when I used to record music. Uh, for fun with friends, but yeah, the website design, no, thank you. No, no. <laughs> and I, you know, it's, they are fun to watch and we'll get to the behavior, I guess when, when we get there and I will uh, put the panda cams on there. They're just, they're so fun to watch and just, you know, they're endearing. They're just an endearing species. Now the pandas round face, which is kind of interesting. You know, you talked about their, their ears and they have this real wide face. That's because they got some, tremendous jaw strength yeah their bite strength is like number five on the mammal list just right behind lions so pretty pretty strong pretty strong uh wow. yeah, yeah 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 and just they've got to i mean they've got to have the endurance too, just to chew all day you know like when you you chew too much you're like your jaw hurts <laughs> yeah i think a viral video went around a while ago of just a panda chewing and i just i sat there like 
<laughs> and just listened and just, to it and watched it. Yeah. 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 And, and you stay tuned towards the end too, because I do have a list of where pandas are located outside China. So, you know, I'll cover some of the zoos that you can go visit them. They're not many. There's not many, but they are around the world they're and they're amazing to see. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, amazing and to see. you have a few international fans, which is yeah. awesome. So you'll have to send us a message and let, if you are international, um, let us know where you live and why you like us and what species from your country you would like us yeah. to cover. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Now, Angie, this one kind of made me sad a little bit. Predators that eat pandas, the giant you pandas. Stop it. I don't want to hear. Uh, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not listening. But I, you know, it's like I have to see it. So, so adult uh, adult giant pandas generally don't. Eat, okay. But the cubs are a little bit more vulnerable to snow leopards. Uh, the martins. Boy, that's another pretty one too. It's like the pretty eating the pretty. <laughs> yeah, Asian black bears or even maybe other leopards. Oh, really? But again. Okay. There, you know, there, when we get to conservation, there's not that many of them. So, you know, but they can be preyed upon uh, sometimes. But again, they're probably, you know, even though they're not a carnivore, they're still big guy of the the forest there. Oh yeah, yeah, they've got the, they've got some decent sized teeth on them, that's for sure. And claws. Yeah, I mean, they got grizzly bear claws. I mean, I looked at them; they're they're big. Now, you did allude to the nutrition, and it's interesting that they don't really have special gut microbes. They subsist on this herbivore diet. They have a digestive system of a carnivore. Right. So let's, let's, and there's not that much. I was going to say, there's not that much nutrients in it. Yeah. There's just not a lot. Oh, And so let's back up the bus a little bit, because I think for some of our listeners out there that aren't as nutrition. Dorks dorks. like us. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I was going to say nutrition fans, but, uh, so when, so when we talk about digestive system, we're talking primarily about the digestive tract. So not necessarily the esophagus, but the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine are much different are, are basically your diet determines kind of how the tract how long, which parts of the tract are longer or bigger and due to how you extract food. And so in general, a little bit of carbohydrate and fat breakdown will start in your mouth. So digestion starts in your mouth. And then as food passes down into your esophagus, it hits your stomach, right? And this is the same for all animals, all mammals. And inside your stomach, there's enzymes there that are going to start breaking down proteins. From there, the food will enter your small intestines where, at least in humans, and so it's going to be different in mammals, but in humans, that's where like 90% of your digestion takes place in your small intestines. And humans are omnivores, right? So we eat Typically, not all humans. I'm sure we have tons of vegetarian friends, and I bet they have very healthy digestive tracts. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, But, and then from there, then the food will go into your large intestines where uh, a little bit more fiber digestion will take place, water will be absorbed, and then obviously out the door goes. We all poop, all mammals poop. And so an animal that eats strictly grass, let's say a true herbivore, so not a panda, but like a really true herbivore, like my favorite, the zebra or a horse or a cow. Or a cow, ruminants, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Their digestive set system is going to be more suited for that, more suited to help break down the cellulose that's in plants, the stuff that we don't really get a lot of nutrition out of, um, but a lot of animals that eat primarily plants have evolved different strategies to extract more nutrients out of that plant material. And a big way they do it, especially in cows or animals that are ruminants, is that they have this big vat. Their stomach consists of four chambers, and it's like a big vat. I think of it like uh, when John and I used to brew beer. Mm. Back in the day before kids, we had a lot more fun. Um, (laughs) So come and, on, you're having tons of fun with those two. We are, we are. We're not brewing, but we're not brewing beer. Maybe brewing beer, year, no, maybe, no. Maybe next year, maybe next year. Um, But no, but there's a big vat in their stomach and that's where the microbes live and the microbes help the animal 
get more nutrients out of the plant fiber than they, than like for me or you, for humans. Hmm. Am I explaining that right? Do you agree so far? No, no, so yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. You're good. You, I can tell you've been teaching. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, when I teach, I have to talk about humans and that's, yeah. I mean, humans are super cool, right? Obviously. Um, our biology is a miracle, uh, physiology, but it's really, my students actually get a kick when I always compare us humans to animals. And then I think it helps them. It makes it more relatable. I think. Yeah, sometimes. no, it's good. Yeah. Um, but anyways, and so an herbivore's digestive tract is going to be different and a lot uh, more complex to get more, more bang for their buck with this like fiber. I mean, they're, they're eating like sticks and like, hay and things that just, if you and I ate, we would blow away, right? If you want to go on a diet, eat hay. <laughs> oh God, no, don't eat hay. Don't eat hay. <laughs> don't eat hay. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Um, and nobody needs to go on a diet. It's all good. And so we're a carnivore, right? They eat meat. So they eat a lot of protein. And so a big portion of their digestion is going to take place in their stomach. And so their small overall the length per body size their length of small intestine and large intestine right the long tube that absorbs a lot of nutrients and a lot of vitamins and all these important things is shorter and smaller and so because they just they do a lot of digestion in their stomach and then they get what they need and then they poop it out yeah, and just people, you know, trying to imagine this, you know, when a lion gorges, right? We can all see that. Like everybody's probably seen lions in, on nature shows. That they big belly. They have that huge belly and they sleep forever. You know, not only to conserve energy, but to digest because again, blood flow, like after everybody eats a meal, like Thanksgiving, right? Everybody's notorious for taking naps after eating Thanksgiving dinner. Because we gorge ourselves and we have all that blood rushing to our stomach to aid in digestion. Right. So that makes us tired. Same thing with these carnivores. They eat huge boluses of meat, just swallow as much as they can, and it's all in their gut. And then they they need to go lay down and and let their stomach break down the protein. So, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. And so here we have our cute, adorable panda with the track, the gastrointestinal GI tract of a carnivore that was fine theoretically eating one big meal a day or one big meal a week, or that's how they're designed. And here they are living off of bamboo, a very fibrous plant, leaf material, and they're eating it constantly. So pandas, just like our buddies, the horses, eat about 16 no, about 10 to out, 10 to 12 hours a day. So not quite as much as horses. Horses are about 16 hours a day with their, they would be consuming plant material grazing. Pandas are about 10 to 12 hours a day of feeding, which is vastly different than our friends, the lions that like Chris just said, they, they chase something, they gorge for an hour and then they, they're done. Uh, and so because of this, they're eating about 99% of their diet is bamboo and bamboo being the plant that it is is very poor nutrition. Very. So, <laughs> yeah. When the panda was evolving to live <laughs> off of bamboo, it maybe wasn't the best choice. No. <laughs> if you, as far as now, now, now we all know there's, you know, zebras and goats can live off of nothing basically. Um, so there's certain animals that have evolved to live in desert, arid places mm -hmm. that can live off of nothing. And it's kind of what the, the panda did, um, except for it's not living off of nothing. It consumes about anywhere from, I think it was 20 to 40 pounds a day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say 15 kilos. So yeah. we're close. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, I mean, but yet only about 70% of the nutrients that are found in the bamboo leaves are actually extracted. Right. Right. They just don't have it. And they, so, there's like, there's like no like bioavailability in bamboo. It might be pretty in your wood floors or cabinets, but to eat it, the bioavailability is just not a mucho, no, right? No. Like there is 17%. That's very low. Yeah. Um, I don't know the, I wish my nutrition friend Taylor was here or Jesse, they could shout out some numbers for other forages as far as uh, what the nutrient values are. But uh, I, 
I do know enough to know that the seventy percent is very very low. low, and and that leads to to them being really low energy animals, right? They're known to it's not they're lazy, they just don't have the energy reserves to to get up and go. And, you know, right. like, imagine if you eat celery all day, <laughs> are you going to want to run a marathon? No, no. <laughs> like, you have to put some peanut butter on there. I, but... I was going to say, it's peanut butter. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be smiling and laughing, let alone wanting to run a marathon. And that's, you know, but so, yeah. And so, uh, I don't know the exact nutritional content of a celery, but I once, I once heard a story. I don't know if it's true, but, uh, one of the fad diets was like, oh, if you eat celery and in grapefruit, your body's actually burning energy to okay. like get rid of it. Yeah, it's probably a wives' it. tale, yeah. More, yeah, more than like more than the calories it actually is. So I don't know um, if that's true or not. I'd have to look that up. But yeah, and I think, and the other thing that's really interesting and unique about pandas, they are very, very unique, is that their stomach walls and their gastrointestinal tract are extremely muscular. And so they have a lot of peristalsis and a lot of smooth muscles wrapped around uh, that stomach to basically help digest the woody material in the diet. And then the, the gut is actually covered with a thick layer of mucus to help protect against spit splinters. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Poor, yeah. Poor guys. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Maybe that's why they, cause they're well known. Anybody who's watched any panda cams or hopefully will after, um, after this podcast, but pandas are really well known for their upright feeding position. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And which which basically leaves their forelegs kind of free to like handle the bamboo stalks, and they just look super cute and charming while they eat. But who knows? Maybe that's an adaptation so they don't get splinters. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Now the way they do get digest this, right? Because they don't have any natural enzymes or, or you know inherit gut microbes. They're actually they have to get the bacteria to digest this bamboo from mom's poop. So. We know this with horses too, and some other livestock animals and, and other wild ungulates. They eat mom's poop, which is actually a natural behavior. It's kind of disgusting. Right, when they're born. Yeah, it's kind of disgusting, mm-hmm. but they're getting the microbes to populate their their intestines and stomachs and things like that. Well, intestines and intestinal tract. Get the ball rolling down there. Yeah. yeah. Now this was a fun fact. How many times do pandas poop a day? Oh, that's fantastic, Chris. I did not look this up. This is why you're my partner in crime. This, this is the best. Because you love poop. Oh, I love poop. My students know I love poop. Okay. Anything about poop is amazing. Um, I'm like a five-year-old kid, like poops and butts and reproductive yeah. tracts, like whatever. Um, they poop 40 well, times a day. Up. Okay. Oh, man. You're Sorry. Sick. I was going to guess. Oh okay, yeah, I would not so, have guessed forty. I would have, yeah. I would have gone with more carnivores. You know, maybe once a day, twice a day. Right? right? Think of your dog. Right. Um, uh, but in horse is you know, ten, ten times a day. Yeah, ten. So, ten. Wow. I would I would have guessed like ten or twelve. But you're saying forty. Yeah, because so you were talking oh. about that that. It made that peristaltic contraction, so their their gut is always constantly always moving. moving. So that's that's probably why there is a lot of pooping going on because they're constantly. I'm going to shake my, uh, the next time I see my zookeeper, panda zookeeper friends, I'm going to shake their hands. That must be a lot of work (laughs) to clean that. Now it's kind of interesting, you know, going into behavior because they are so low energy that really affects their behavior and what they can do. Right. I mean, Sure. Yeah. I mean, not to me, because I think they're just cute sitting there. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think, for instance, um, unlike a lot of other bears, they do not hibernate. Now, they will, in their natural um, habitat in China, they will descend to lower elevations during the winter, but they, you know, probably because of either their metabolism or they can't, they don't, they don't, they don't build up a lot of fat. And they, uh, like a lot of other Bears do, which makes sense when they're eating this uh, this low nutritious all salad yeah, diet. Yeah, it's hard to build up fat. Well, I wouldn't know, but I I've heard that if you eat all salad, it's hard to build up fat. And so, so they don't hibernate, um, and what they uh, and they don't typically build permanent dens like other bears, but rather they'll take uh, shelter in like hollow trees and caves. They're primarily on the ground or terrestrial. But they're great climbers and they are capable of swimming. And 
They do spend, as you would think, a lot of their day, like we said, 10 to 12 hours eating and then a lot of it sleeping the rest of the time. And the younger ones, of course, of any any panda cam, any species, uh, any, uh, <laughs> especially in the panda cams or just, yeah, any species, they do like to play a lot and they have this running, chasing, climbing on each other's tumbling. They kind of already have an ambling gait in general. And they really are like the truly roly poly creatures that they're somewhat um, animated to be. I mean, they, that's really, they do really kind of move like that. So, now, what people might not realize, if you're not familiar with uh, panda bear behavior, is that they really, they're actually a solitary type creature um, for the most part. And that's what was historically thought, um, that they're mainly solitary except for the breeding season, which I'll touch on shortly. However, recent research suggests that pandas do occasionally meet outside of breeding season and they will communicate with each other through scent marks and calls. But the research is still kind of unfolding on why that is, if it's not for breeding or what that might mean. Uh, one of my kind of favorite aspects about some of their behavior, well, there's a lot of it, obviously eating the bamboo, sitting upright is just super charming, but m mama pandas will play with their cubs, but not a lot of moms in the animal kingdom and myself included They'll play with young to like appease the young to, cause like just, I mean, literally right before this podcast, my two year old was like tugging on me, Zachy. He's like, mama trains, mama trains. And he wanted me to play trains with him. And so of course I'll do it most of the time or, or I'll make John do it. <laughs> depending. But, <laughs> Come on. I saw you play with those guys. Yeah, oh yeah. I play with them all the time and you, you have to, but obviously you're doing it. I mean, it's fun as a human, but it, you're, you're appeasing them, right? They want to play. And that's how it is in the animal kingdom a lot. Like the little one kind of bothers the mom and the mom or the dad or the sibling will be like, okay, let's play. But with pandas, they've actually recorded some mothers waking up the infant to initiate play. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome. Yeah. And so that, Chris, I can be... Honest to goodness, I don't think I ever see myself waking up my boys in the middle of the night to play with them. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. No way. way. Nope, nope. So, but I, but you know, so there's some but I think a lot of that shows their genuine kind of easygoing nature or, or they do have even as adult they do have a little bit of this playful aspect even though they're not super rambunctious cuz they have this bamboo diet. Uh yeah. So I just thought that that was really, really a neat part about their behavior that I was reading about. Um, and as far as panda communication, one of their prominent ways they do it is through scent marking and they'll leave it in their territories. And it's a huge form of communications uh, that the researchers don't really understand a lot of, whether it's the pheromones or what's going on. Um, but we do know the giant panda can determine from one scent to another. So if Bob or George or Susie or who was in the area, um, and they can tell how recently the, the, the mark was left. And in the case of females, this is probably how, how they tell the males if they're where they are, where they're at in their reproductive period and if they're receptive. And so basically a giant panda when it is time to mark their territory, they back up to a tree and rub their scent glands on the tree. And then they use their cute little tail. We didn't even talk about that. Mm -mm. They use their cute little tail to spread the scent, like a little bit of maybe like <laughs> spreading the peanut butter. <laughs> it's like the hippos. Remember the hippos spreading yeah. the... Oh, yeah. Well, the hippos goes in a circle. Yeah. A, hippo, a, hip, a hippo spraying um, uh, poop is... That's like a helicopter. You do not have to <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I guess you probably don't want it to be near um, a panda tail spreading anal scent glands either. However, it still seems slightly more charming than a hippo um, at any rate. But yeah, they basically a lot of times it's the males to back up on the tree. And at some Chris, they describe it as like a male as he backs up on the tree. He basically does it until he's basically doing a handstand. In order to place the scent mark high, high up on the oh, tree. Oh, that's crazy. We should watch. Yeah, see if you can see that on Panda Cam. That would be cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or could you, yeah. Like I said, I always like to take animal behavior and put it onto human behavior. I think I could do like some serious Saturday Night Live skits with it. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I just kind of, I, I try to picture John. Like, <laughs> your hands your Christmas tree behind you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Behind the Christmas tree. Like, honey, what are you doing on the Christmas tree? It's time? my tree. On the Christmas tree. Yes, it's my tree. <laughs> I live here, not you. So, so funny. Um, but speaking of my wonderful, marvelous husband that does not do handstands on my Christmas tree, although I wish he was <laughs> sometimes, um, let me go grab okay. him really quick so he can tell you what it's really like to work with a panda because I just adore them from afar yes. and he, he's adored them up close, up close. So welcome back to the podcast, John, Angie's husband. Hey. <laughs> we have been. <laughs> so excited to talk pandas and have you on. I just our friend Jesse down in New Zealand is the one that shared with me how much you love pandas. And so, oh yeah, so. oh yeah, it's, they they hold a special place in my heart. So let's just explain it. Like, what would you yeah. do with them? Some of the things you saw. I mean, some of the things I know you you love them deep down somewhere. But right, right. You know your experience working with them, and then your experience with conservation and, and the facts with pandas and things like that. Right. So uh, I did work with them when I was in Atlanta for a little while. Um, I spent some time over in that, that special place with, with the pandas. And at the, at the time, they, had, they only had a pair there, um, but they've been successful in breeding since. But I only did work with the uh, adult pairs. And, and, you know, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about my experiences first and then get to kind of <laughs> the, the bigger picture on them. So, yeah, if, if you do, if you're a super, super panda fan, you may want to turn the radio off for the, for just a little bit. Uh, fast forward. Yeah. Fast forward. You know, um, pandas, because they are so unique in so many ways, which I know you guys are talking about, it makes it unique to, to care for them. And because of that, they essentially become the prima donna of the animal world and the animal care world. I mean, they really are spoiled brats. They really are <laughs> spoiled brats, you know? And again, are they cute, cuddly, and fuzzy? Yes, they are, absolutely. And I'm not taking that away from them, but they are spoiled. And, you know, part of it just boils down to, again, <clears throat> it's all wrapped into the physiology and what makes them unique as far as car um, carnivores that are, are that are herbivores that only eat, you know, bamboo. Um, but it makes them very, very picky. And in the wild, they're going to roam around. They're going to find whatever bamboo they want. And it, it did give me a really great appreciation for them because you start to look at this animal and you see that they, they can make a distinction between, I mean, hundreds of species of bamboo, really, but we only fed them probably 20 species of bamboo. And they can make a distinction between the various species of bamboo, the time of the year that the bamboo is cut, and kind of the age of the bamboo. So essentially what it means is if they get a piece of bamboo or a, a bundle of bamboo that they don't like, they just won't eat it. And they'll just wait there for more food. And because of the high profile nature of this animal, you can't just let, you know, it's not like your kids like, well, you don't like it. You know, well, you don't eat. Yeah. It. Yeah. You can't <laughs> do that with them. You have to feed them. So we had a, a special team set up just to cut bamboo literally six days a week. That's what they did. And they cut bamboo fresh. And then it was um, put in a fridge to, to keep it chilled, to keep it uh, acceptable for them. And then we would try different bamboo out on them. And uh, yeah, sometimes they liked it and sometimes they didn't. If they didn't, you had to go get them more. So it was, oh, geez. it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. It was like, like I said, it was, it was dealing with a, with a bratty child. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, and that, that made it interesting in and of itself, just uh, this sort of relationship is it's the it's the most unique relationship I've ever had working with an animal where really you know when I've worked with animals and I, again I do admire them I do appreciate them but I really felt like you know I was their hired caretaker and not paid <laughs> very well hired caretaker I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, for all other animals, I felt like, oh, I got this opportunity to work with them. It's a great opportunity to, to spend time with this animal, learn about them. I really felt like I was completely their their house, their house caretaker, their 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 housemaid, essentially. Yeah, your maid or butler. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I was yeah. I was their butler. You know, and 
you know, it just made it interesting. They, they, um, but they are, they're, are, they're a great animal. They're for, as for, again, as far as conservation goes, this animal above all else have captured the hearts and minds of many, many people. And that says something and that there's a lot of value to that for, for, for the field of conservation and for the efforts of cons- conserving the species. That's a good thing. And, and you know what? You talk about looking for bright spots in conservation. That is one. I mean, populations are actually increasing and areas of uh, their, their um, more or more larger areas are being cordoned off and, and preserved for this animal. So there's a lot to be said for them as individuals, as, as spokes animals for conservation. But as far as an individual animal and working with them, they are, pat- they are just a pain in the butt. <laughs> they, they really, they really are. So, they, that they, explains they it, though. Are. That explains and, it, because you know, and 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 then again, one of the the great things about them, because of the high profile nature of them, the the staffing component around them is much greater. So you have a higher ratio of staff to animals. Again, more than any other animals out there, even elephants. Um, so you had more staff there, which is a good thing, but. And that necess- uh, that uh, lent itself to a greater research component, which was interesting to me. Like that was that's something that I really appreciate about zoos. But they they did diet studies like nobody's business on these animals. So in and out studies, and when I say in and out studies, I mean every single thing is weighed on the way in, and every single thing is weighed <laughs> on the way out. Uh, you know? I mean, I know you've done that with yeah. horses before. I know you've done in a. Right. Your wife did yeah, exactly. that quite a bit. Yeah, she did that quite a bit. Try that with pandas. Yeah. Try that with animals that did have habitats. So you'd have to go through the habitat and find every piece of feces. Or they strip bamboo. They either strip off leaves or they break open the culms, the, the, the stalks. And you have to find out every little piece because you want to see what exactly they ate, you know, and then and then what exactly they produced out the other end. Mm-hmm. Came out. Yeah. Spoiler spoiler alert that it, they don't get a lot of nutrients out of it. They have to eat a large quantity just to maintain their body weight and their their nutritional components. And we and and here we fed them other things besides just bamboo. They would get treats of um, uh, apples or there's there's um, biscuits that we give them like leaf eater biscuits or whatever. So it wasn't exactly all bamboo as they would have in the wild, but it was a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, I think that's what we were asking because earlier we, you know, I I told Angie that they pooped forty times a day on average. So oh, yeah. cleaning that's that exhibit lot. must, that yeah, was, yeah. It's just the weird these weird. Um, they're larger than dog feces, but these green lump turds, yeah, mass they're, they're like all <laughs> over the place. Yeah, it's, don't it's step a, in them. Yeah, no, it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Now, did you get to go in the exhibit with them, or do you have to lock them away? No, Cause, no okay. yeah, the, yeah, you, you have to show it's a protected contact system. Okay. So you have to shift okay. them from one location to another. They are still bears, you know, and that's yeah. again that's one of yeah. the problems is is people that's again the the tricky part of they have such great notoriety is people get infatuated by them and they will. You'll see this occasionally. Guests will you not usually hear, but in China, we'll try to get into enclosures with them, and right. they're still bears. They will still, you know, they could kill you. Yeah, they could. They got teeth. They could still kill you, absolutely, or, or hurt you very badly. You'll see a lot more videos of of that sort of thing um, in China as well. When they when they raise cubs, they're a lot mm-hmm. more hands on with yeah. them. Um, and again, I didn't do. I wasn't part of any of that stuff. But I. Um, but again, I know from from friends who have worked with them is you know again we try to be as hands-off with them as possible even when raising cubs it's just more natural for the for the mom to raise them but right yeah we, right. we, we would not go in with them so no i never got to snuggle with them <laughs> well who we knows? don't we don't who advise knows? that <laughs> maybe that would have turned me around right yeah. maybe had i been cuddling with the pandas i actually maybe i'm just maybe i'm just a frustrated <laughs> panda fan who never got to cuddle with them and that is why I, I harbor this, uh, this yeah. uh, issue with them, you know. You, I, but again, they're amazing. They're, they're, they're yeah, amazing. they are. They are, and they're they're very iconic. And it's just you know, it's one that we've been dying to cover. And since I heard how much you love them, and now I post panda videos on your Facebook. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, all, all the time. I, I have a lot of panda 
paraphernalia. <laughs> there's a, there's a Halloween costume of me as, as a panda. So and a we brought that up. We might oh, use okay, that as so our cover of this excellent. episode. Yeah, please. Please do. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there is sort of the, um, the, the thing with pandas, some of the things that people don't know is that the United States, uh, most of the zoos in the United States do not own their pandas. They don't have, they don't have them. They don't, they don't have, um, sort of ownership of them. So they essentially work with the Chinese government. There's actually two entities over there. It's a little complicated, but they, they work with the Chinese governments to lease them essentially. And zoos pay a lot of money. For for the the privilege of just leasing them. And it is, mm -hmm. it's a five year lease and it's usually extended to a 10 year lease, but they pay for every individual that they have, including any offspring that are wow. so okay. as as there's an offspring. A, a zoo is paying, paying the government of China. So the, the good thing is that that money does go towards conservation work, but it is a tremendous burden that the zoos have to take on just for the privilege of having having them. them. Yeah, like I said, it's they're they're a resource intensive animal as far as man hours um, to care for them, man hours to cut food for them. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of attention that goes into them. Right, and, right. And that's that's zoos. You know, here's the thing: zoos um, don't have a lot of money. You know, zoos are, again, they're trying to do the best they can to care for the animals as well as support conservation in the wild. And so it's one of those species that, you know, is, it can be a drain a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It can be a little bit of a drain, you know, yeah. and some zoos do a really good job with it and they, they make it worthwhile. And obviously you're, you're looking for all of the um, interest you can bring in when you have pandas on ground. So, you know, it, some, some of them make it worthwhile. Yeah, no, and I, when I was there at Zoo Atlanta, it was packed. Uh, you know, I saw them at the National Zoo. I saw them at San Diego Zoo when they first got them way back when. So they're, they're a huge draw and they get people there to learn their story. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're great iconic species, but eh, that's a lot of insight. You know, I think now I, yeah. now I get it. Now I get it. Now I get it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? they, they really are. They're, they're, they're a pain. Again, I, again, love them, but they yeah. are, they are a, Hey, all right, go know. get the panda lover back. <laughs> You're right, the, one, the one who actually does the, 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 the rosy sunshine yes. of the panda world here. All um, right, we'll talk to you again yeah, soon. Yeah, absolutely appreciate yeah. the time. Yeah, Take care. thanks, Sean. Now we have the the actual panda lover back on. <laughs> it was good having John. Man. He's he's oh, great. He's we, so great. Yeah. Yes. No. He he bring he makes he. He, t he tells it like it is. He tells the real story. <laughs> yeah. No, he's great. He's great. And it, it, it good insight too. You know, I mean, it, it is insightful. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And um, yeah, his stories are, his stories are always well appreciated. So mm -hmm. hopefully you guys mm -hmm. enjoyed them. Yeah. And, but yes, the one thing I don't think I heard him talk about at all was th their super cool reproduction of the Yeah. Story. Yeah. 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 Go, go, go. Yeah. Which once again, when I heard my husband John mention that they're a little bit of a prima donna from a nutritious standpoint, interestingly enough, this theme carries over into their reproduction as well. Uh, and why that's the case, Chris, is because females will only breed once a year in the spring and their receptivity mm -hmm. to period, the receptive period is only one to three days. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. For the whole year. And that's it for the whole year. So it's one thing to be polyesterous, which like we talk about in horses where they have multiple cycles uh, throughout part of the year. Um, and then, and then sometimes we, there's a few species we've covered that are monoesterous that have one cycle. And that's what the panda would fall under this one cycle. However, typically the, window to get pregnant or the window to be an estrus, the window to be receptive is usually greater than just like one day or one to three days. So that's what makes them really special. <laughs> We're <talking about> how <laughs> special pandas are uh, when they're housed under human care, as far as a lot of the, um, a lot of the lengths to get them to breed and reproduce, um, is, is it is challenging and there have been a lot of zoos that have had some su success with it in my interview in a couple of days uh that we'll be posting 
uh, we'll get to hear about zoos, a zoo that has been successful with it. But it is, it's not for the faint hearted. It takes a lot of scientists, reproductive biologists. I, hopefully they'll hire me someday. Um, and so, yeah. And then with that being said, when we're talking about conservation and their, their success story and their numbers rebounding, is the breeding maturity of a panda is generally between like four and eight years. So it's, it's a while. And so now, okay. So now we're talking about an eight year old panda is solitary and the male and female are sol solitary and the male that does his little headstand almost on a tree to scent mark his glands. And then the female comes along and she sent marks and they somehow have to find each other. Mm -hmm. And not only do they have to find each other in the wild, but they, the male has to find her within that one to three Days. day window where she actually is receptive. And then let's say that does happen, which of course it does in some, in some instances, there's actually a delayed implantation, which is what we've talked about in this pod before. And a delayed impl implantation means that the female, the female will be bred and the egg and sperm will unite and a fertilization will occur. And the embryo will develop into one, two, five, 15, however many cell um, blastomere. Mm -hmm. And you probably know it's what, 32 cells or something like that. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure the cell count. Yeah, but 64, anyways, it, yeah. it, it, it just keeps mm -hmm. doubling. Yep. 128. Yep, it, yeah. it, develop, it, it develops very little and, and basically freezes and waits for further cues later on. So in a panda, it's about a month and a half. So about 50 days later or so, uh, 40, 40, 50 days later, it'll get some kind of signal. And of course, research, researchers have no idea what signal that is. And then that will trigger this, this paused diapause, yeah, diapause, yeah. uh, mm -hmm, diapause embryo to then implant into the uterus and start doing normal development uh, embryo things, normal growth, becoming a, um, a fetus and developing all the organs and so on and so forth. And then after about one and a half to four months of this embryo, small embryo, few celled embryo being in diapause, there'll be a, must be a hormonal cue. Researchers really don't know what it is at this point in time that will trigger the embryo to come out of diapause and implant into the uterus. And then that's when the real development starts where uh, the, the, um, the embryo starts grow, you know, really growing and the organs develop and it becomes a fetus and so on and so forth. Um, and so because of this delayed implantation, uh, pandas are also known in what the, to get what they call pseudo pregnant, pseudo pregnancies, which means they can be producing a lot of progesterone and seem like they're pregnant, but they're really not pregnant. And so that's been really hard uh, when they're housed under human care too, for researchers trying to figure out if the panda is pregnant or not pregnant. Um, but there's some cool panda cam videos that of um, from the National Zoo. Up, it's actually a panda show and a four series show about uh, pandas, the pandas that live there at the Smithsonian National Zoo and some of the care that they receive. And one of the females receives regular ultrasounds. Voluntary, of course. She comes in and presents. She lays on her back and eats. They feed her like honey water. And she just, she's just like getting her, it's like she's at a, like, <laughs> a spa a yeah. or something. She just lay, yeah, her spa. She just lays on her back and they give her the ultrasound. And they're, and they're basically doing that because they can't necessarily trust all the hormonal data that they're getting um, from her, uh, probably her feces and urine. But but let's say all this works out, um, and it does, then when a panda sometimes uh, can have twins, but usually a, a, a singleton cub is more, uh, more common, and it's teeny tiny. So at birth, giant pandas are, like most other bears, are blind and helpless. And But unlike other bears, giant pandas are actually covered with a little bit of layer of fur. Most bears aren't. And they only weigh, Chris, like 85 to 140 grams. Wow. Wow. Yeah, they're little. Like 15 centimeters, like the size of a pencil. Not even. And so they're pretty helpless, but the mamas do a great job of taking care of them. And they open their eyes after six to eight weeks. And basically the mother uh, will ha um, help 
once they're born, help place them in the right position to suckle. And a baby will suckle up to 14 times a day, a baby panda, which is a cub. And a, a cub will suckle for up to 30 minutes. And and then they really, around three to four months is when they really start kind of moving around a lot more on their own. And they usually don't wean themselves till um, anywhere from, you know, one to two years typically. So, but my one of my favorite behaviors that a mother panda will do is she'll hold the, the cub to her chest as she sits mm-hmm. up almost like a human mother. And it's just, to me, it's just so, so sweet. So, um, so yes. And of course the males do something in panda reproduction, but we, we're not, <laughs> we don't have time to talk about them today. That'll be, yeah. that'll be the male or that'll be the, uh, that'll be the follow-up podcast because it's the females that we care most about because they have this, just this small window, um, monoestrous one cycle, three, one day, basically out of a whole year to get pregnant. So the stars have to align and, um, And yeah, and so that makes it when they're, as we move into the conservation section, I would say that that, you know, that makes things a little harder for them. Um, No, it does. It does. And, you know, they're still listed as vulnerable, uh, you know, again, because China has put so much emphasis on conserving them. So that's really good. But and the numbers are low. Like what's like what's they're still the low. Yeah. So there was about a thousand in the wild in 1976, okay. and then there was as low as 800 in 1985. Now China's been been obviously putting um, more emphasis on them. So today, roughly, we have over 2,000 and about three or 400 in in under human care. Okay. Right. So there's still that's still a tiny population. Yeah, that I is know. not. A, isn't that isn't that crazy? That I mean, I, I I understand it, but that's still considered. That's not even endangered or critically endangered. That's only vulnerable. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good. Their population's increasing, and there's it been is. a that's lot great. of emphasis on them, but they still. You know, they have poaching, which has gone down, which is good, but they still can get poached. But mining, tourism, you know, like John was talking about, you were talking about pressures of people, infrastructure, you know, moving into the areas. So yeah. China's working hard on creating new reserves and actually, which is really cool, they're making these bamboo corridors between them all mm-hmm. so that they can go between, find mates, uh, and move between these. But Still, they estimate about a third of all wild pandas are outside these reserves or protected areas. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, this started in the 60s and there's still, you know, there's still some challenges, but luckily there's a big spotlight on them and, and China is doing everything they can. They've done great work with Brzezowski horses too. So, you know, China's doing some good work uh, there. Just got to stop, you know, in pangolin and all that other rhino horn. It's not good, which is not really so much China. It's other parts, but ivory, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now who, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of panda organizations, but who, <laughs> who's the one we're going to highlight this week? I really want to highlight this week, the Smithsonian national zoo and conservation uh, Institute. They have done incredible work. They have pandas um, and stay tuned for the interview coming up and you'll learn a lot more about them. Well, Chris will put up the Smithsonian National Zoo's link on our show notes, but it's nationalzoo.si for Smithsonian Institute dot edu. And they have, of course, they have a panda cam, so you can get spend plenty of time there getting to know their pandas. Um, and they also have a series of videos called the Panda Channel that uh, are phenomenal pretty short videos that can give you an insight a little bit more into panda care and enrichment and activities. And of course, a really cool ultrasound of one of their females. Um, and uh, my favorite is uh panda eating an apple pop popsicle. So it's, <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I know the, yeah. uh, the Smithsonian has been a leader here in the United States as far as, um, as, as far as panda conservation goes, panda awareness, panda education, panda love. And I just really, they give a lot of money back, of course, to their preservation in China. And they work a lot with the Chinese officials and how to better preserve, uh, preserve these guys. And so they do incredible work, work and their website's beautiful and, uh, and very educational because it's the national zoo. So they're going to educate you as well. 
Uh, so yeah, I just want to applaud them for their great work. And of course, all the other zoos that uh, are that house them and help people fall more and more in love with the species and, and kind of uh, promote this national Chinese treasure and symbol, including the Memphis Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, and of course, Zoo Atlanta, which is what John talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then yeah. lastly, Chris, I want to highlight a group called Pandas International, and they can be found at pandasinternational.org uh, and, of course, on Facebook. Pandas International is one of the most recognized conservation units that's dedicated solely to panda education, research, uh, care, and their mission is to ensure the preservation and propagation of the giant panda through many different avenues. Like I said, education, public awareness, research. They give a lot of money back to China and different reserves in China uh, that work with habitat preservation and enhancement. And they work with a lot of local Chinese uh, officials. And Panda International has a lovely website that's really well done, beautiful image galleries, great, great videos as far as showing all the different behaviors. Um, and they'll answer any panda question you might have. They were voted one in 2018, um, one of the best nonprofits top rated. So as far as giving back money to, uh, the different groups in China to help protect these guys, they get a gold star for that, which is awesome. And I love, love, love Panda International. Their motto is one of their mottos is endangered means we have time extinction is forever so it's really hopeful like you know we do have time but we got to get some stuff done and so they have a newsletter you can sign up for um lots of reasons of why maybe i should have john read this about why you should love pandas <laughs> not just kidding <laughs> he, he loves them he loves them but anyways he check does. out um yeah check out their webpage they've got a blog facebook group of course, on Facebook. Yeah. So check out Panas International as well um, to see what those folks are doing both loc- are here in the U.S. as far as education and then research overseas in China. Cool. Cool. Well, this week's conservation tips, you know, make this really quick. You know, we're, we're really trying to make our homes more energy efficient, you know, reducing carbon footprint, fossil fuel Use emissions. Bamboo. So. <laughs> Yes, bamboo is a good one. It's it, and one of the things I was going to bring up was make sure you know when you bought, buy appliances that they have Energy Star. That's not just in the U.S. That's also in Canada, the European Union, Japan. They have Energy Star. But here's something everybody can do because I'm trying to just give like one quick tip a week. Set your refrigerator temperature at three to five degrees Celsius or thirty-eight to forty-two degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's the most efficient temperature. 38 to 42 F for us Yanks and then three to five for everybody else. For us don't set your, don't, your refrigerator. Do not set your refrigerator to three to five F you'll freeze everything, your milk, everything. <laughs> now your, your freezer can be minus 18 to minus 15 Celsius or zero to five degrees Fahrenheit. So if you set your temperatures at that, that will help conserve energy. So there you go. Awesome. Now, real quick, yeah, real quick. Where are zoos? Angie already mentioned it. San Diego Zoo, Memphis Zoo, Zoo Atlanta, and the Smithsonian Zoo in D.C. are in uh, the United States where you can see pandas. There is a zoo in Mexico City. We have some listeners down there that can see them. In Asia, you'd have to go to China to see them. Poor you. You know, maybe see them in the wild. God, that would be amazing. How cool that be? Australia. Yeah, Australia, Adelaide Zoo has two pandas, which is really cool. Awesome. So all of our listeners down in Australia, you can go see send, them in Adelaide. Yeah, send photos. Tons in Europe. So Edinburgh Zoo in Scotland has them. And they, it's kind of funny reading this. They have to fly in the food from the continent. So John doesn't want to go to the Edinburgh Zoo. Tell, yeah. with pandas. So those are some prima donnas. They get their food yeah. coming from a jetliner. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some in Belgium, Belgium, they have them in Finland, Spain has them, Copenhagen has them. So they, there, there are pandas in Europe you can go see, but that's about it. Uh, You know, like most of them, that's only like 49 outside of China. 
Right. So it's really special if you get to see them. It it's is. really special. And, and John and I are supposed, I mean, we're only now, we're only five hours away from Atlanta. So, I mean, that's a hot skip and a jump. So you'll have to make a field trip here soon. Yeah, no, no kidding. No kidding. All right. You know, another good pod. We're going to be back next week. I think we go back to the ocean. Angie blew it earlier. Um, <laughs> send this podcast to I've any of your band of friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thanks for listening and we'll uh, be back next week. All right. Thank you, Chris. Great pod. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.